My name is Georgina Keith, Local Studies Librarian at Randwick City Library. It gives me great pleasure to open our second live online history author talk today. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which Randwick City Library stands and also wherever each of us are located today. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Helen Pitt began her career in journalism at the Sydney Morning Herald in 1986. She has worked for the Bulletin Magazine in California, New York Times Digital, and as a television reporter for Euro News in France. Her feature writing has won her numerous awards, including a highly commended in the UN Media Peace Prize. And for today's subject, she was the winner of the Walkley Book Award in 2018 for The House, the dramatic story of the Sydney Opera House and the people who made it. The house reveals the backstory of the building that transformed Sydney from a provincial sleepy backwater into our global city of today. The conception and construction story itself involve a disparate cast. The internationally famous conductor Eugene Goosens, the working class state premier from Sydney's inner west, Joe Carl, and the two architects from opposite sides of the world, Jorn Utzen and Peter Hall whose lives were forever transformed by this project. Helen's narrative effort effortlessly blends her primary research from diaries, letters, classified archival records, and her own interviews with people involved in the project. It is a gripping plot worthy of a Shakespearean drama, and I found it to be equally as eloquent. I always thought my empathy would only ever belong to the Scandi Cool Utzon, who envisaged such a beautiful building standing on Bennelong Point long before he visited the site. I must say though, that having read Helen's book, it is also Peter Hall and New South Wales Premier Joe Carl, whom I have come to admire. Towards the final pages of Helen's narrative, she includes a quote from Paul Keating in 2006, which I think sums it up for me. Woodson's building, like all great art, never weakens. No matter how often you see it, or from what angle you look at it, or in what light it is cast, it always hits you in the heart, because it's simply so great. It is without any shadow of a doubt the greatest building of the 20th century, and one of the greatest of all history. I am sure you will be absolutely enthralled by the intriguing complex history of the house, with all its twists and turns. It is my absolute privilege to welcome Helen this afternoon to talk with us. Welcome, Helen. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks, Georgina. And thank you so much for hosting me and all the libraries across Australia who thank who, who host authors. It's a really terrific thing to have. Thank you. It's so a I'm, I'm going to show you some never before seen artifacts and slides that have been kept on um, in the Sydney morning herald archive our photos from this building that unesco described in 2007 as one of the indisputable masterpieces of human creativity not only in the 20th century but in the history of humankind so it was the the genius of a young architect by the name of jorn utzon in 2008 i was driving across san francisco's golden gate bridge listening to the bbc world service on the car radio when i heard that the Danish designer had died age 90. Like many Sydney siders the world over, I imagine, I felt an instant stab in my heart. Those of us born in Generation Yawn, as I call it, all knew the great gift he gave our Sydney, now the Sydney Opera House. I'd lived in San Francisco nearly a decade at that point, but was overcome with a wave of nostalgia for the city of my birth. As I drove north across the iconic Golden Gate Bridge that day, I glanced to the right almost expecting to see the internationally known white icon of Australia. You know that feeling you get when you drive or catch a train or bus north across the Sydney Harbour Bridge and you catch yourself distracted by the mid magnificent white sails of the Opera House. So I glanced right and instead of the San Francisco Bay, I saw this. Sydney Harbour, October 20, 1973. Now I'm not one of the girls in this photo, but I was an eight year old girl on the windy spring day, Queen Elizabeth II opened our nation's most famous building. I was with my family on an especially chartered ferry 
perched in prime position to catch a glimpse of the newly completed Sydney Opera House. We were typical Sydney siders, eager to see the opening of our city's much talked about building that had taken nearly two decades and $102 million to complete. Giant red ribbons hung from the Opera House shells and billowed in the blustery wind. Decades after the ribbons were cut and the balloons and pigeons were let loose, Listening to his obituary on the radio that day, the day that he died in far off San Francisco, I was struck by the tragedy of his story. Most people know it. The Dane who dream, dreamt up the idea from, from Denmark to design a, a, an extraordinary building who departed in, after a dramatic dispute in 1966, never to return again to see his masterpiece complete. But what I didn't know Ben was that the tragedy was intertwined with many other tragedies associated with the building on Benelong Point. So let me take you back to the beginning of this story, Sydney 1954, February 3rd to be precise, when this story began. More than a million Sydney siders lined the harbour from before dawn to watch the steamship Gothic carrying Queen Elizabeth II glide through the heads. More than half the city's 1.8 million population came to see the first reigning monarch step ashore in what was the biggest event to happen in Australia at that point. Here she is in Martin Place in a photograph I found in the Sydney Morning Herald archive. You can see the fold even on the photo. And she went to lay a wreath at the Cenotaph. Sydney was awash with Union Jacks and all over the city streets, there were these plywood banners bent in the shape of boomerangs containing crowns atop. They were made by Ralph Simons, whose plywood palace on the Parramatta River was renowned at the time for producing the world's longest plywood rolls, some up to 15 metres in length. Simons is one of the tragic figures in the Opera House story also. But there was no cultural centre to take the Queen to when she visited. Here she is pictured with Marek Fulborn and bred Premier Joe Carl in the staircase of the David Jones department store in Elizabeth Street, which other than the Sydney Town Hall was as grand as Sydney got in 1954. In the same year as the Queen's February 54 visit, in November, when Sydney was awash with a sea of jacarandas, Premier Joe Carl, our inner Sydney hero of this story, decided to do something about that. He called the first meeting to discuss the idea of establishing a cultural institution called the National Opera House. Unsurprising for the era, he intended to approach Buckingham Palace to call it the Royal Opera House. The meeting was held in the lecture room of the Sydney Public Library in the Queen Victoria Building. Nugget Coombs spoke on behalf of the Elizabethan Theatre Trust, which he'd convinced the Menzies government to create in the wake of the first rural visit which he hoped would spark the dawn of an enlightened Elizabethan era in this colonial outpost. I am certain, he said, that if you succeed, your name will live for the next 400 years as the head of government who put the opera house there. That's what he told, told Joe Carl. Benelong Point, which at this point was the turnaround point for the city's trams, is perhaps the most beautifully located tram depot in the world, was the location suggested by this man. This is the man who's the brain behind the whole idea. This is Sir Eugene Goosens, the British born Belgian conductor of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. So after seven years of tirelessly lobbying his boss, Charles Moses, who was the head of the ABC, um, they, he, they were the people that actually administ administered the orchestra that he, uh, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, that he, finally got a meeting with Joe Carl to discuss this idea. It took him seven years to get a meeting with Joe Carl to say why he thought that um, there needed to be a better building this, than the Sydney Town Hall for the Sydney Symphony to perform in. So he'd, he vowed to make his fledgling Sydney Symphony Orchestra as famous as Australia's cricket stars. Well, instead, what happened was Goosens became infamous when he became embroiled in Australia's most dramatic pornography scandal in 1956. It involved sex, black magic, 
Rosalie Norton, known as the Witch of King's Cross, and a dramatically swift departure from Australia, never to return again. I call it my Fifty Shades of Eugene chapter, and it's probably best read in the privacy of your own home because it's quite racy. Um, but he was the first casualty of the Opera House saga. Before he left, the conductor, who was also a steam train and cruise line enthusiast, asked artist Bill Constable to sketch a preliminary idea for a building at Benelong Point that could house a symphony. So this was what he, he, he did on behalf of Goosens. And you can see he'd been living in America for um, quite some year before he was offered the job as symphony conductor head and head of the conservatorium on a salary that was more than the Prime Minister at the time, Ben Chifley. So his idea for an opera house included these rounded piano style windows and an outdoor amphitheatre, which is a sort of classical musical performance space, which is along the lines of the Hollywood Bowl. So instead of this idea, the Carl government announced an international design competition offering £5,000 prize money on February 15, 1956. The same year the world would be watching the Melbourne Olympics and the same year TV came to Australia. So Joe Carl, he was a seasoned political campaigner and a bit of the silent hero of the Opera House story. Um, he really shone under the spotlight of the television cameras. He was a born performer who'd never seen an opera in his life an unashamedly working class man who played the pianola and the piano in his Marrickville home at 44 Warren Road in Marrickville, for those of you that are in Sydney. It's a sort of Federation style house. It's now a white two story thing, but it's cement rendered. And it's sort of ironic that it's white and cement rendered a bit like the opera house. His children and grandchildren told me that um, there were many sing-alongs around the piano and um, he, 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 it was the only instru musical instrument in the house. But even as the state's top politician, he remained living in this same modest brick bungalow in inner, West, inner Western Sydney, where he raised his children and his grandchildren went to very often. Um, he was an ambitious man with really big plans to put his city on the world map. He was, we call him the ordinary Joe, who was the founding father of the opera house idea. So he was raised in inner city Redfern within the tightly knit community of railway workers there. He left school at 13, started as an apprentice fitter and turner at Everly at 15. And then um, lacking in formal education, he went to uh, WEA to do a lot of public speaking at night. And as a young trade unionist, he, he really started to shine because of his oratory skills. So he tried to enter state politics several times unsuccessfully, but um, they, they finally, he finally got elected and rose very rapidly in uh, the New South Wales Legislative Assembly. So he, 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 what was remarkable about him in a world of sort of political cynicism, that he was just this ordinary man driven by a very sincere conviction that all people, rich or poor, had the right to share the good things of life. And that was really why he risked his career to achieve what must have seemed an impossible dream to many, the Sydney Opera House. So Carl appointed a four judge panel to choose a winner. And this man here, Finnish born American architect, Eero Saarinen, who's been on the cover of Time magazine in 1956, the year the judges were appointed. He's a man alleged to have been the one who really chose Utzon's designs from the pile of rejects on the floor at the New South Wales Art Gallery. So here he is with the model of his gateway arch in St. Louis, Missouri, which he won the, de the design competition to build. He was the son of Finland's most well-known architect, Eliel Saarinen, who's still, you know, he, his father and grandfather, he came from a long line of Finnish architects, so very well known in Scandinavia. He got, um, his father got second place in the Walter Burley, um, to, place to Walter Burley Griffin, in the design competition from Canberra. So if he'd won that, who knows, we would have had a very different looking capital city. Um, so this man grew up beneath the rounded domes and cupolas of his family's Helsinki villa. And he was a fan of this form of architecture. As you can see, he was very keen on the curve and looked to them in you know old, old forms of architecture. So it might explain why. Um, he was actually working on the design for the TWA Flight Centre, which is, this is here, it is at Idlewood now, which is now known as New York's JFK Airport, when he was asked to be one of the judges. So 
I met some New Yorkers last year who, who said they always call this the bird building because it still, it sort of looks like it will take flight. And it's been since turned into a high class hotel. Um, and Saarinen had met Jorn Utzon when Utzon was on a study tour to the United States in 1949. So they fellow Scandinavians, they had a sort of similar sensibility. You might see some similarities between that and the Sydney Opera House, and unsurprisingly. So what happened was Utzon was on his way to study Mayan temples in Mexico just after um, the war, which later formed the inspiration for the podium for his masterpiece. So he stopped on his way to Mexico in Michigan and met um, Saren and here. The two Scandinavians ended up becoming friends. And you can see here that, you know, it was called the Grand Central of the Jet Age, this building. So Saren and arrived four days late for the judging. For the, there were three other judges there and they already could have gone through the 233 entrance and, and he'd retrieved entrant 218 from the pile of rejects. You might see more similarities here. This is the, the original um, winning design from the 233 entries that they arrived from all over the world. They came, you know, from the Eastern Bloc, from America, from South America, all sorts of crazy madcap ideas. And initially the winning design had included this gold leaf under the white curves of the building. Um, and this is how it appeared in the days just after Joe Carl announced the winning design at the Art Gallery on January 29, 1957. So the judges chose this relatively unknown 38-year-old Danish architect, Jorn Utzon is how the name was spelt when Premier Carl read it out, Y-A-W-N, because they couldn't pronounce J-O-R-N. Um, and uh, at this point, his proudest piece of architecture was this very building, his own home in Hellebeck, which is just um, out of Helsin Elsinore, north of Copenhagen, which is kind of famous as the Kronborg Castle, which is the setting for Shakespeare's Hamlet. So Utzon built this yellow brick building facing, um, it, 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 it faces south. So in the Northern Hemisphere, it brings in lots of light. As you can see, a classic modernist design with lots of internal courtyards, because he was very much inspired by the inner Chinese style courtyard. So this was his grandest accomplishment. He'd actually entered 20, in, or he'd entered many international competitions and won 20 of them, but none of them had come off the ground. So the judges said his drawings were simple to the point of being di diagrammatic. So Saarinen sketched it more thoroughly for him um, before handing it to the winning, before handing the winning envelope to Premier Carl. And one judge, Sydney University's um, Harry Ingham, Ingham Ashworth, commissioned a fellow university um, lecturer to render it in watercolour, which is what you see here from the pages of the Australian Women's Weekly on February 20, 1957, which also compares some of the other buildings. Um, you can see it kind of stood out compared to the, the, the second and third prizes. Um, uh, they were, the runners-up came from America and England. One, that one immediately under the, the Opera House, the one that we know to the left, had a helicopter landing um, space on the roof. And another entrant from our Sydney Morning Herald illustrator and architect, George Molnar, was in the shape of a manly ferry. So goodness knows what we could have got if they didn't choose Bjorn Utzon's design that we came we come to know. So it took several months from January 1957 to July of that year for Premier Carl to convince his caucus of the benefits of this design. In fact, many, including the, the ABC, thought there was just no way Carl's Labor colleagues would pay for such a bold building. So a motion to scuttle it was avoided when Carl decided to take the proposal to the ALP State Conference at Town Hall. And an immigrant woman by the name, we only know her as Miss N. Napper. She was from the Clothing Trades Union and she was from Malta. And she said she was sort of able to convince the really blokey blokes from the ALP that an opera house was more than just something for, as she said, hoity-toity people. She got a standing ovation when she told them that her small homeland island of Malta had the world's third biggest opera house. So her motion, her, her convincing oration got a standing ovation and her motion was successful, the opera house would be built. 
So Utzon came to Sydney for the first time, as we see here in July 1957, with his business partner, Swede Eric Anderson. And they're showing the Sydney Lord Mayor at the time here, Harry Jensen, known also as Headline Harry, the model that they brought with them, which was to try and explain what the Opera House would look like. And this was the launch of the public campaign to fund the building, a, a thing called the Kissing Party, which I detail in my book, which I had absolutely no idea. It's one of the colourful chapters of the, the, the history that I found. So here we go. Here's Joe Carl kicking off the building in a ceremony in March 1959 at Bennelong Point. So Carl called the building his baby and literally kissed the ground here the day that the building commenced. And as he leant down to kiss the plaque made in the Danish shipyard Utzon and his wife Liz brought from Denmark, the police band struck up the My Fair Lady hit at the time with a little bit of luck because that's also at the same time the pneumatic drills began in the background. So the man who built, whose company was responsible for building the podium, civil and civics Dick Dusseldorf of Lendlease, who you might know as the grandfather of the actress Marta Dusseldorf, um, he was responsible for the stage one of the building. He was there that day too. So within the, the tragedy is within six months, Carl would die of a heart attack who was like the next tragic figure to display, to, to, to disappear in the Opera House story. I've put this in because I love this. This is the trowel, the trowel that you could see him pinning that plaque into, which is now in the, the remains in the Carl family um, uh, archive. It's used as a, a cake, birthday cake cutter. And here we are, um, this is me in the center with, Joe Carl's granddaughter Judith and her husband Michael, who presented me <laughs> with the trowel at um, the opening of a thing called the Carl Room at the Marrickville Library. So we used the trowel to actually officially open this, and it's it's such a delight for me to have that like piece of memorabilia in my hands because what I've loved about writing this book is all the the stories that people come and tell me, sort of incidental. It's all about their love of this building and. I know Georgina's got a relationship with the building herself. Everyone I know who's a Sydney sider and, and even from abroad has a relationship, but this was a particularly special moment. So it was Carl's ingenious idea to set up the Sydney Opera House lottery. It not only meant that the money for it didn't need to come out of the state coffers, it meant that Sydney siders would pay for the building out of their own pocket, making it Australia's sort of first crowdfunded building is the best way I'd describe it, which may be why we feel such an attachment to the building. I think we have a real sense of ownership over it, as seen in 2018 when uh, Racing New South Wales tried to project some slides onto the uh, to, to advertise a horse race. So the first lottery was drawn in January 1958. All told, 469 lotteries raised the bulk of funds for the total cost of the building. It would set the scene, perhaps the best known tragedy associated with this building, the Graham Thorne kidnapping and murder in 1960. It was the first kidnap and ransom case in Australia um, when a little boy was taken from his Bondi home. I won't go into the details again, it's in my book. And it was the first time that forensic medicine was used to track a killer, when the scientists used the DNA testing to match the dog hair found on an Onka Paringa blanket that the little boy's body was buried in, in Clontarf. And thereafter, not for publication, was an item to tick on every Opera House lottery ticket. So the building proceeded for the six months in October 1959, Premier Carl drops dead, collapsing in Parliament before dying of a heart attack next door at the Sydney Hop Hospital at the age of 68. Um, so this was a real tragedy and the Labor, Liberal and Country Party members, like all fierce foes in the bear pit of state politics, all of the men openly wept in Parliament when the news of his death was announced because he was a real sort of local political hero and there was a minute silence immediately. His friend Cardinal Norman Gilroy led the Requiem Mass in the state funeral for St Mary's at St Mary's Cathedral, which you see here. And it's attended by more than 4,000 people, but the really extraordinary thing about this was that more than 200,000 people lined the streets of Sydney, especially all along the course of Parramatta Road to Rookwood Cemetery and dipped their hats in the court as the cortege um, passed by. People across the state were like, really plunged into a sense of grief for this man of integrity. He'd be at that point our longest serving New South Wales parent, Premier. 
But the show must go on, as they say, and the 30-member Opera House Committee was appointed as the client to architect Jorn Olsen. Here's Ron Thompson, the secretary of the committee, examining the blueprints for the building. In hindsight, it may not have been a great idea to have 30 people um, set up to be the client for the, the architect. Ulsen, Ulsen worked closely with them, but, you know, design by committee was very cumbersome, which may explain why costs got out of control pretty quickly. They usually bowed to Ulsen's ideas, um, but government architect Ted Farmer said many years later, it probably would have been better if the architects if the architect had been put in charge of the, the whole building rather than a hodgepodge of Sydney ciders. So Utzon's father was one of Scandinavia's best known boat, boat, boat builders. He was a naval architect in the northern Danish city of Aalborg. Um, he designed what became internationally renowned in scouting circles as the Aalborg dinghy. And I point that out here because this is the interior of the concert hall, which you can see looks a bit boat-like and like an uptown, upturned Viking vessel. Um, here you see also workers using, again, Ralph Simon's plywood um, to construct the wooden moulds for the more than 2,000 concrete segments that make up the building. The way you sort of need to think of the building of the opera house is it's like a giant Lego kit with epoxy resin a sort of super glue that it's like a consistency of condensed milk that pins it all together. And it's the first time such a technique was used to build something of this scale anywhere in the world. So you can see why here that it was a real effort of multicultural Australia. Over 10,000 workers from 90 different countries took part in the construction of this building. I interviewed quite a lot and they all felt it was the most important work of their life. The crucial component of the shell was a movable erection arch, which you can see here. It's a bridge building technique, which was de devised by the stage two builders who took over after Lend Lease completed the first stage. Uh, it was a Queensland construction firm called Hornybrooks. It was designed by a man called Joe Batoni, who I interviewed, I found and interviewed. He was 95 at the time I'm, I met him, I think. Um, he was a French spy who escaped two concentration camps and was given an award for valour from the French, French president for his wartime activities. Um, he, he died last year and it was one of the great tragedies for me. But the beauty was he was at my book launch and Louise Heron, bless her, gave him a funeral in the Utzon room, which was the, one of the most heartfelt things I've been to in the course of this Opera House story. So after Carl's death at the 1959 opening of Ralph Simmons plywood factory, Simon, Simon, sorry, plywood factory at Mortdale, um, that's Breakfast Point right near the Olympic Stadium, uh, a maverick entre he was a maverick entrepreneur who, who zoomed around in his plywood plant in this Dodgem style device. He, he saw the absolute vision that Jornutzen had for this building. And he went to visit him in Denmark to sell his products. So Utzen was very impressed. But in 1960, Simon's lifeless body was found floating face down in pit water after he fell down a cliff walking. Utzen continued to work with his company despite it going into receivership, just as he worked with the Hoganast team in Sweden who designed the tiles, more than 1 million of them shipped to Australia, and it's now known as the Sydney tile. But one of the greatest tragedies of the Simon's death is that Utzon's operesque sort of plan to involve the Sydney of people in the building of the factory, uh, the building of the Opera House didn't take place because the plan was for the plywood plants to be assembled at Simon's factory and floated down the Parramatta River on barges as a way to sort of involve the people of Sydney in the project. It was meant to be a sort of conflation of Aida, the opera set on the banks of the Nile about the building of the Cairo Opera House and Handel's water music performed on the banks of the Thames for, the King, for, for King George the First. So my, my publisher at Alan Unwin calls this a kind of opera, uh, the Oscar and Lucinda part of the story. And it is, it's, it's real a tragedy that we didn't get to see that. So above is the plywood palace that the parts were meant to be assembled and sent down Parramatta River, um, built with plywood, which was used variously as a, uh, this, this point now has been used as a WestConnex storage, it's still in existence. But like the light rail today, the building of the, of the Opera House, although enshrined in ALP policy, became a political hot potato. 
the Aspen government won the 1965 election by a very slim majority, even though it was an ALP premier and premiers that continued it until 1965 because it was taking so long and becoming quite political. The Askin government won with a mandate they believed to fix the Opera House mess. So here we have the Public Works Minister, William Davis Hughes. He was appointed, he was a country party member. Um, he got rid of this executive committee and took over the building control the, the the design decisions related to the building he essentially became Utsun's paymaster and a falling out between Utsun and over Arab the Danish um, uh, engineer that he was working with on the building um, was the result of, of a dispute over the use of the plywood um, and you can see the plywood here is it's sort of like models that they were going to the, the, the actual the mullions were meant to be made of of plywood which are the, the sort of the jousts you can see in the windows but that had never been done before Utsun felt you could do it but the engineer didn't necessarily believe that you could so this was sort of the heart of one of the opera house disputes the fact um that and the fact that Utsun uh, that Hughes had stopped paying Utsun and he sort of he sort of blackmailed him saying that I'm not going to pay you until you submit your plans which Utsun, who was dyslexic, didn't really have, um, and a completion date. So Utsun had actually wanted to use Ralph Simon's plywood just as, he, as he's done here in the construction of the Dubbo Civic Centre of all places. He called this a sisu roof. And sisu is a Finnish word, which means um, to pull out of yourself something you didn't think was possible. So he set up his loyal lieutenant, a fellow Dane, Morgan Pips Boos, in, in an office at Simmons Western Sydney factory to, to work on this roof, as I said, that was planning to be um, shipped down it, it shipped down the Parramatta River. And you can see it, sort of, it resembles a bit of an interior of a Bedouin tent. He'd gone travelling in Morocco in the 1940s, Utsun, and he was really inspired by interior tent design. So this is not most likely what the interiors of the Opera House would have looked like had Utsun completed it. This is the Bargsvad Church in Copenhagen, a northern suburb. And it's a project that Utsun worked on with his family in the aftermath of the Opera House saga. It's said um, that, again, you can see this this curved sisu -like, wave light -like roof. But Utsun's plywood plans, including the procession, were of course, as you know, scuttled due to the events in the Chief Secretary's building on February 28, 1966. Here he is on that day, a photo taken by one of our Herald photographers. Utsud went to Davis Hughes's office as there'd been a standoff over payments owed to him and the plywood mock-ups. And um, he said, Eventually, after a long conversation, Woodson said he was forced to leave by, by Hughes. The Herald reported as he resigned angrily in an interview. The details are one of the most dramatic chapters of the book, which led to the departure of the Dane on April 28, 1966, which was actually the day after Over Arab arrived in Sydney from London for emergency talks. Possibly if he got there in time and if the two hadn't been so sort of stubborn and pig-headed, we might have had a different resolution to the Opera House story. So this is how the Opera House looked the day the Dane departed. Weirdly, on the day he left, a cloud obscured his view from Bedelong Point. I interviewed his family who were in the car that day and recall him driving in his Citroen to the airport, glancing over his shoulder for one last look. Um, so the, the tragedy about Utsun and um, over Arab is that they only ever met once again. They never talked after this building, the fallout over this building. So my book includes in previously unpublished letters between them, which I found in the Utsun archive, his personal papers after he died from my, I went twice to Denmark to research this book. So Arab's family says the Opera House story is a sadness that stayed with him until his death at 90. Both men lived until 90. So Utsun said he had the building in his head like a composer has a symphony, which was, you know, a problem for anyone taking over the project because he didn't have it down on blueprints. So Utsun's legal team, which included a young barrister that you might know by the name of Neville Rann, um, 
who ended up becoming New South Wales Premier, and another Clive Air Evert, who was his friend Harry Seidler's father-in-law, handed over the plans. The trouble was there was just not detailed drawings, only four fine craft models like this one here, which outlined his plans for the interiors. Woodson started legal proceedings against the New South Wales government to get the money back that he felt he was owed. So the job fell to Ted Farmer, the government architect, to choose Utzon's successor. He chose one of the finest young architects in the country, a man, this man, by the name of Peter Hall, whose prodigious talent had won him scholarships to Cranbrook, Wesley College at Sydney University, and a travelling bequest to Europe. He met his university sweetheart, Libby Hall, in London, and they went to Europe for their honeymoon. They even visited the Utzons in Denmark and stayed at the Hellebeck home and hoped that they might, that Utzon actually offered him, Hall, a job in his office, but he declined in order to return to his job at the government architect's office in the public works um, department. He worked there as part of his university scholarship and a traineeship. And an international ban was called for by international architects on the Sydney Opera House. But eventually Hall took on the job of what was certainly the most unpopular job in architecture in its day. It did stop, all buildings stopped there for two years. So nothing really happened until this was resolved between 1966 and 1968. So as part of the interior design, Hall commissioned a lot of Australian artists. This one, John Coburn, um, he commissioned to create the tapestry curtains of the sun and moon for the opera and drama halls respectively. The curtains were part of the building for the first year it opened, but were taken down because they were considered too distracting by the resident theatre companies. Uh, um, this is seen, they've been in storage ever since, which is uh, such a great tragedy. They, a test hang took place last year and, and actually on May 22 last year, they were hung again in their glorious position. And I, I saw them, it was actually the day of Joe Batoni's funeral. And they still remain to me from the day I saw them as an eight year old, one of the most beautiful things in the opera house. So against all odds, the consortium of Peter Hall, Lionel Todd and David Littlemore, who is the Silk Stuart Littlemore's father, they completed the building amid much controversy. Tragically, Peter Hall received little credit for his hard work. His marriage dissolved and it was a point of shame for his children to even tell people that their it was their father who completed Australia's best known building. His daughter Becca fled to London and never returned. Hall remained, but lost a child due to cot death and that marriage collapsed too. He went bankrupt many times um, and tragically became a bit of an alcoholic. He was even picked up on the streets by the Salvation Army once. So in 19, 1994, the Unseen Utzon exhibition, which was due to take place at the Mitchell Library, seems that was his undoing. He died of a stroke, aged 64, and yet another figure in this Shakespearean light -like tale. Utzon, on the left here is an old man returned to Denmark, but was shunned by his profession there. The Danish Architectural Association warned him he'd never work for the government again, because it looked like he'd walked away from the job in Sydney. He took private commissions at home and abroad, including one for the Bardsved Church. Um, here he is, he finally did in the years 2000, um, return to Sydney. Premier Bob Carr considers the rapprochement between Utzon and the New South Wales and the New South Wales government, which occurred then, to be the proudest accomplishment of his premiership. So Utzon worked with his son Jan on the project, and here he is with Australian architect Richard Johnson. But he never came back to Sydney, as you probably all know. Here he is with the tapestry that is designed from the Utzon room, which was sort of inspired by the German composer Bach. It's said that Utzon and Joe Carl got on like a house on fire, and it was certainly an irony that, um, that the political godfather of this building is better remembered for this, the Carl Expressway, right? Right next door to the Sydney Opera House. You can see the better long building apartments there, better known as the toaster buildings. Um, it, that is one of the great tragedies of this story, because even though the Opera House was known in the, as the Taj Kahal, Joe Carl's name is barely associated with the place today. So, you know, the, the mona way that visually Garot's circular key um, is the thing that we remember him for. And may, many people say that Joe Carl would have been more comfortable with a vehicle carriageway name for him than a house of culture. But 
today we've got to remember just what the Opera House means to us. It's a brand more recognised in Australia, has a total social asset value estimated by Deloitte's to be in excess of $6.2 billion, which is remarkable. Um, here's a portrait, a family portrait of Joe Carl that's kept in his home. Many of the people who loved to flutter at the races at Randwick, um, Rose Hill and Canterbury, um, He's a, he's a man of the people that loved all those things more than he loved the opera. But before he died, his family told me he told his son, Tom, the politi politician who took over from his seat, to make sure the opera house gets built, to keep an eye on my baby, he called it. So I always felt that the fact that the Danish designer who dreamt up the 20th century's most famous building, who never saw his masterpiece complete, was the tragedy of this story. But you can see there are many more tra tragedies than just Utzon's behind these triumphant white sails at Benelong Point. Although while it was being built, the whole opera house um, was the background to many of our childhoods and many joked that it would never get built. You know that it did. And it is one of, as UNESCO says, one of the, as Paul Keating said, one of the most beautiful buildings in the world and probably the most beautiful of the 20th century that still hits you in the heart. But it's, it's, it's Joe Carl's words I want to leave you with to remind you of the political hero of this story. He said, if we in our lifetime did nothing more than express our love of the arts by providing a building worthy of them, even when names are forgotten, the building will always remain as a testimony to what was done in the year 1955-54 by a group of citizens for the encouragement of talent and culture. Okay, do any of you have any questions? Helen, thank you for that. That was marvellous. I think the two quotes that uh, spoke to me were the one I used uh, were from Paul Keating and Joe Carl that you yeah. just mentioned. So um, my question without notice uh, before we get some in the Q&A, uh, which I'll leave you to read out, was what figure in this drama um, has had the most impact on you? Um, if you had yep. to single out anyone in particular. Yeah, okay, I do. I can single out someone in particular. Can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. Can you hear me? Um, the, the character that I love the most is, well, I love them all, actually. They become like members of the family, but Richard Laplastre, Rick Laplastre, who was a young architect and boat builder that ended up working in Utzon's office. He, Utzon lived up in the Northern beaches and walked past a beautiful boat one day that he really loved. And this was at the Bayview Yacht Club and he remembered it. And the young boat designer heard that he'd been sort of impressed. So the boat designer wrote him a little letter, beautiful, you know, two B pencil. And um, this was Richard Laplastrier, who was a young architect at the time. He joined the staff of Utzon's, um, uh, uh, Utzon's staff in uh, the 60s, worked at Benelong Point, but then went to the Pitwater office, which um, Utzon, which was probably <laughs> a real frustration for his colleagues, moved to a boat shed in Palm Beach to work from because he was getting increasingly, um, he, he was having some real difficulties in his personal life. His brother had died, his father had died, uh, sorry, his mother had died. A, a, a lot of a, sort of real sort of tragedies happened and real problems with being pushed by the New South Wales government. So he, he went to this boat shed in Pitwater, kind of didn't have a phone and started working on the plans there. Richard Lepastre worked on the dream home that he wanted to build in Bayview. And tragically, it did not get passed by the Warringah Council at the time. So Richard still lives now. There was a beautiful documentary on him on the ABC maybe last month, I can't remember if it was, it was um, you can eye view it if you just eye view Richard Laplastrier. And I spent a day with him up at his home in Lovett Bay on Pitwater. And it was, it was so um, moving for me because he was in tears still talking about how much of an impact Jorn Utzon had had on his life. And you can see this in this documentary. And one of the lovely stories I remember is he even called his son Ero after Ero Saarinen, who was the man that pretty much was the, the, the 
the, the man that we need to thank, the judge that we need to thank for choosing what's in this building. And after many years, 40 years of not seeing his mentor, he took his young son, Ero, to Copenhagen to meet Jorn and Liz, his wife, who at this stage were living in an old folks home. And they had they were both passionate sailors, passionate boat builders, passionate architects. And Richard remembers sitting with him and um, saying to, and, and Jorn saying um, to, to Aero, Aero, look at your father's hands and their wizened old sailor's hands. He said, those boats have won, those hands have won many regattas. And they laughed and, and, and Richard said back to him, Aero, look at Yawn's hands. They drew the Sydney Opera House. I always loved that. I yeah. think that's really poignant. Um, I almost went last the night when I read that. It yeah, was very, very moving. And as you said, everyone has an emotional connection somehow to the building. They and, do. And um, the absolute toll that... Uh, that it the took on project. so many people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly Utzon himself, his family seemed to thrive in Sydney um, and the lifestyle seemed to suit them, but the absolute toll that it took on um, uh, both Woodson and Peter Hall as yeah. individuals um, was the most striking thing to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I will leave you to answer some of the online community questions now yep. and come back in a little bit. Yep. So I have a question from Georgina Gaw Gordon, Virginia, Virginia Gordon, sorry. Hello, how are you? Um, so she asks, what was the most surprising discovery you made in your research? And is it in your book? Yes, it is. Um, it is the seven page handwritten letter that I found in Jornotson's files written by Over Arab to Jornotson. And it had never been seen before. It'd been never by public because I found it a decade after Utzon's death. And when you write a book, you have to track down all the family members that are still alive that are better fact uh, that are you know trustees of estates and so forth so i thought this page this letter had probably been seen before but i found his granddaughter and and who led me to his daughter who was still alive and over arab's daughter said i've never seen this letter before it's really really heartbreaking and so for me that was just the depth of the, the feeling this building elicited from both these men. I mean, it was a great tragedy for Over Arab to not be able to complete this building and the destruction of his relationship with this man that he looked upon as his son. So for me, that was really surprising. I mean, there's lots of surprises. Obviously, as I said, all those tragedies rolled into lots of things, you know, but, but for me, that was, that was really surprising just how many people other than Utzon felt really strongly about, about, um, about it. Um, was Utzon's, I don't know if this is from J, J M, um, was Utzon's dyslexia something he tried to hide? No, no, actually it was something, uh, no one much talked about. I didn't have a word for it at the time. And it's only his daughter that, who was equally the same as one of the most talented artists. You could ever catch that she's a ceramicist um, that that sort of discussed it. It's just that it he struggled at school. He was he called himself the dumbest person in his class as a young boy, and that was simply because he struggled with reading. He did he didn't read much. You know he he had a different way of seeing things, and he was an absolute genius. And this is what I would say to anyone who knows anyone that's um, in any form of any form dyslexic or trouble struggles reading and, or even writing that the gift of his vision in another in another way of looking at the world is 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 truly his gift because he had such such an eye for beautiful buildings that you know obviously you can see his talent the world even even just his home it's he's built a home in Mallorca in Spain and it is so stunning google it you, you'll see it it's just um it's can list it's called it's it's one of the most beautiful buildings i've seen in my life so so i don't think he tried to hide it i'm pretty sure he didn't no, we just didn't know very much about it at the time um david castle how do you think peter hall should be commemorated in the sydney opera house and why hasn't it happened yet yeah that's a really good question david 
the, the thing I would say is it took the Opera House 20 years to acknowledge Jorn Utzon. When it opened, the only plaque that was there was saying that the Queen opened this building in the presence of her husband, and it's still there today. Um, and then they did put a, a sculpture to him explaining the um, way he, he discovered the, the, the underpinning of the geometry, the, the orange solution is what it's called. Um, it, it, that was there and that, that took, you know, until the 90s to come up. So my hope is, well, not my, not just my hope, a group called Opus SOH, who are the group of architects that worked with Peter Hall, are building a lot of momentum to try and get the reopened concert hall. When it reopens, it's closed at the moment for renovations, that when it reopens, there will be some recognition on site. It may not be the concert hall. That was what they would love, but it may not happen. So like we have to, as an Australian public, keep the pressure up on the Sydney Opera House because the time is right now for that to happen. And I believe, and any of you that read my book, I think will understand why I think it's important that he's acknowledged. Was there anything that you could not include in the book? Oh God, where do I begin? Yeah, I mean, I think by that you mean like just too controversial. I mean, there were occasions, there, there were, you know, when you write a book, lawyers go through it and if there's something vaguely defamatory has to come out I'm used to dealing with that as a Sydney Morning Herald journalist there wasn't anything much it was very minor and I could live with it so um it the really important thing to remember out this story is the Sydney Opera House was built and taken over by the Askin government who with the benefit of hindsight we know is one of the most corrupt New South Wales governments of all time, which is really saying something. So that, yes, I couldn't include some certain things about them and their, you know, the way we look back at them now. So that's really the main thing, but it's an important piece of hindsight that we need to bear in mind that this could have had a very different outcome. We have what we have now. And I love, you know, the outside is what's and the inside is hall. I love them both now. And maybe it's because I'm, it's what I'm used to, but for me, they complement each other. I think that's it. There are a couple of chats here. Um, I hope everyone saw it now that I got it going. I'm very sorry that I couldn't get the slides going at the beginning. I hadn't realised that was happening. If by chance you do want to co pick up a copy of my book, um, Georgina will tell you where, but I'm going to give a little plug um, to my local bookstore, which is Gertrude and Alice and the wonderful bookseller, Jane Turner. If you don't know it, it's at 146 Hall Street, Bondi Beach. She will, there are signed copies of the book there, but she will also post them to you if you are not in Sydney. Um, just Google Gertrude and Alice. The phone number is 91305155. Um, but feel, feel free to purchase it anywhere. But if I could give a little plug for, um, my local bookseller, I'm going to do that. Thanks, Georgina. Thanks, Helen. We have shared with the online community a few other ways that you can get hold of your book by purchase and also by loaning it from Randwick City Library. Um, I would, it falls to me on behalf of Randwick City Library to offer our heartfelt thanks to you, Helen, for sharing your passion and your knowledge of the history of our beloved Sydney Opera House. Um, the house is an enthralling read and will make us all look with fresh eyes at this magnificent building the next time we visit. Um, so please, thank you for sharing your Saturday afternoon with us and everyone else online. I appreciate you attending as well.